don't know. All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Try and bring people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to episode, I think, 339. We're going to talk about Venezuela tonight. We're going to talk about the shutdown. Lots of great information. Harry is uh, remote for reasons we'll explain. Aaron Ewert, after a two-year hiatus, is here. And our friend Alina is here. She is, uh, I'm, I'm afraid of saying her last name because her, my, her mom might beat me with a chakala. So, uh, a chakla. So, <laughs> tune in. This is uh, recorded on January 29, 2018. And we'll be right back. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. All right, welcome to We Are Libertarians. We're so glad to be back this week. I had a nap, so I'm feeling very punchy, mostly towards Harry, who is not in the studio, who is remote. Uh, he is not even in his seat. And I'm very annoyed with how bad he sounds because he should know better. So he's on timeout. So I'm going to introduce Aaron first. Aaron, how are you? Oh, doing well, Chris. How are you? Doing well. It's been a long time. We'll explain why in a moment, if look, I'm allowed. You look good. You look spry. <laughs> I'm very spry. Uh, let me just turn this off because otherwise we won't be able to hear him with such poor quality. You'd think after several hundred episodes of the show, Harry would understand how to do a broadcast, but that is not the case, apparently. Harry, how are you? I'm going good. Going good. See, listen to how quiet he is. Barely. What do you mean? Oh, that's that's not that's me. That's not that's I, I'm sorry. Uh, a public apology to Harry. I was blaming <laughs> for my own mistake. Mark this calendar. I actually got a public apology. Mark that calendar. Now I take it back because you sound even worse than before we started recording. How do you mean it sounded worse? I don't know, but uh, you know I've got your other headset here. I'm keeping it hostage until you uh, until you decide to come back. Uh, he he left without his precious headset last week. Yeah, that's my Bluetooth headset um, from the Empow collection, the finest uh, Chinese Bluetooth headsets. All right. And then uh, third here on the show tonight is our friend Alina. Ali I don't know if you want me to say your last name. You can. <laughs> okay. And I feel like I, I'm not going to say it right because anytime I say your last name, I feel like I say it too white. Yeah, probably. Pretend Alina there's an E at the end. Alina Pabone. Yeah, there you go. Okay, see, I did pretty well. Now, Alina is from Colombia, Colombia, as mm -hmm. she says. Uh, and so I, I sent her a message today, and I was like, hey, can you come on in case we say some gringo shit, and you can go, no, that's not how it actually is. She's been to Colombia in the last, uh, what, 12 months, and so she's got some stories, and uh, she's going to give us some details about some of that stuff. I, I met you, Alina. I slid, you slid in our DMs, actually. I you, did. Yeah, our Snapchat, for the We Are Libertarian Snapchat, which I don't use anymore. And uh, we've become good friends. You live in Dayton. You live like an hour and a half away, two hours away. Yeah. Yeah, and so she's a libertarian and uh, in college. And then uh, Aaron has not been here. Uh, do you want to say why you have not been here for two years? Oh, well... You and I, you and I have, uh, you and I have the distinction of being the only two members of We Are Libertarians to have a divorce caused by We Are Libertarians. Well, I mean, it didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> didn't help. It, it didn't. No, in my case, I was. Uh, and, and we had a rule in place at the time. I, I don't know if you guys do that anymore. Yeah, don't cause any marriages to end, and unfortunately, that that uh, rule got violated in your case. Well, it got brought up in court, but you know. right. That and the memes. Right. We Are Libertarians has been, uh, that was Alina with the bottle clinking, and I was going to yell at Harry for it. <laughs> but then I remember her water, water. Uh, yeah, uh, We Are Libertarians has actually been in a court case, in your court case. Yeah, yeah, it sure was. 
It's very, in the minutes. Very distinct. <laughs> yeah, you've not been on the show forever. Uh, a lot of things have changed since you've been on the show. Sure. I, where's Greg? <laughs> All right. <laughs> What? <laughs> I think it's a thwart, a thwart history dot com. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah. Uh, is, that, is that three divorces? No, I think just two. Oh, oh okay. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you you're too clever for me. Uh, no, no, that's just just two. Uh, that was more of a, a gruesome breakup. Um, <laughs> I, I'm playing with the audio in the background now, Harry. Why are you not here? I'm not here because I made the mistake. Well, the awesome opportunity, and I got to hire James Neese at the company that I work with. Now, Aaron, for those of you who don't know James Neese, who is James Neese, Aaron? James Neese is an enigma. He's a wrapped in a mystery. Yeah, but he's a he's the most peculiar person <laughs> you'll ever meet james is our our resident mutualist our our resident left libertarian uh he, I think it, he started I've, 4chan or something he he is one of the original 4chan mods on random uh and he uh i got distracted by your text message it was hannah yeah <laughs> aaron is is dating hannah who was on last week uh, and she texted so i just assumed they were in a fight uh, no, so, so I was trying to get the tea. She's so. worried about the phone. It's <laughs> oh, gonna okay. be cold tonight. So James Neese went on vacation in Jacksonville. He went dumpster diving. He is uh, he he saw you in a particular activity and tried to tag in. He yells about cucks all the time. He's just he's four chan incarnate. But he'll run for public office all and the then time. He'll talk just like he talks amongst us. Yes, but like on stage at a debate. <laughs> yeah. <in a> public- <laughs> Forum. He uses 4chan language when he debates. He's one of the most intelligent people you'll ever meet in your life. He's incredibly smart, but he's just a different cat. The first time I met him, he looked like Tiny Tim. Not the Christmas Carol, but like the 70s his, ukulele player. Yeah, when I met him, his hair was about four feet long. Right. And he was and, working for Rupert, I believe. <laughs> he had a three-piece suit on, and he just he was something else. Uh, he's a father. He so, would take like 40s to the truck stop and try to uh, campaign that way. Yeah. To try to, <laughs> he would try to talk to truckers that were trying to sleep. He'd like knock on their door. So, <laughs> Harry, now why did you hire him? Yeah. I hired uh, James because I needed a technician to run the f- indie facility that um, that I currently take uh, that I've taken over in the last week and I needed someone that could go in there, build that place up because it needs a lot of work. And it kind of freaked me out and it's not really freaking him out. He actually took it as a challenge. Right. And it is strange to watch him work. Because he has, it's just a completely two different schools of the way two different people do IT. There's two different ways to do it. And he's part of that other school. And I've never really seen that part. And I kind of like it. You know, it's, it's James, ex- James's brain doesn't work like anybody else I've ever met. No, it does not. And it's kind of what that place needs. And I didn't realize that until like he showed up for his job interview in like a white tee and khakis. Uh, right uh, impressed Perfect. everybody right. <laughs> and i was like what? he said like it's i just had to show up in a suit and he, he's here in his white tee you know, oh, well <laughs> harry uh never mind yeah but no um so there's all these things that was going so he were he basically runs at 110 percent the entire time he gets there and he's at 110 percent the whole day and we're trying i'm trying to leave at five o'clock <laughs> <laughs> and right. he's still moving on 110 percent of other issues coming in and going yeah we can leave this to tomorrow nope we're gonna get this done now so i'm sitting there and you're like so like six o'clock helping him install and get all these printers and stuff installed yeah yeah and so you text me at like you're 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 always on time you're always here like right at seven on the dot and then like 6 30 you're like hey uh, I'm not, I'm not, i can either be real late or i can zoom in yeah uh so i said uh, alina's zooming in so why don't you too so uh, not actually mad at Harry. People are concerned that you and I are fighting too much. It's it's oh. not real. It's uh, not real. Well, just, just a and, little. And if, and if we did do it, you know, we'd make sure, you know, on air as we do it, you know, throwing but, things at each other. But for God's sake, can you please sit still? Like, Alina is just sitting there like a statue, 
Like she's just statuesque and you are just, you've been around knees too much. You're ticking all over the place. Yeah. All right. Sorry. I'm trying not to move. <laughs> I'm, I can't help but inspect his basement. I, I know. It looks like he needs some drainage. Let, what is that? Let's he switch, switch the view what? here. What is, what in the world? He's, he's gotten some water before me, and they had to trim the bottom of the paneling off. It looks like. Clearly water up to this level. Okay. What is that behind you? Is that a fireplace? It's not a fireplace. Behind me is another table. This is where the my mixer board used to sit back here. Uh huh. Uh, when I was streaming, I used to have the mixer board and everything back here, and now right. I moved it to that side of the base, which is it's. That's right. He has he has a spe he has a soundboard and a good mic, but he chose to you bring to use this for the show tonight. I have a thousand square foot studio uh, here in the Cyberloafing Studios. Um, and I am setting up another location to stream it because the spot where I'm streaming at now was meant to sit with the other cyber loafers here to stream. Well, I'm by myself now, so I don't need this massive area. So I've been setting up a new recording area in the corner, in the closet. But well, that closet. doesn't change the fact. What is that hole in the wall behind you? <laughs> oh, that is where they cut the paneling here because it did uh, because water didn't get in here. So they had a cut up to the... Um, we cut up that high for the um, uh, what is it? Yeah, the uh, oh, so you had a flood. Yes. Okay. okay. No, because right. when after the, you could have just said that. That's all. That's we could have started there. Yeah, because the, I got this house in right around the housing crisis. So the person who had the house before me, they foreclosed, and when they foreclosed, they turned the power off, and when they turned the power off, they turned off all the sump pumps. So, mm. what happens to a basement? It floods. Aaron, Aaron's. Uh, if you're in the Indiana. Ohio. No, I just do Central Indiana. All right, Aaron. Yeah. Aaron does crawl space. What What do you do? Uh, well, stabilize foundations. I fix wet basements. I fix damp crawl spaces and lift uh, sinking concrete sidewalks, driveways. All, all right. Sort of well, hit hit Aaron up. Uh, so, all right. Now, uh, let's let's jump into Venezuela. This has all been fascinating, believe me. No, no, let's stand back and watch. Don't, let's not jump in and go there. Let's not jump into Venezuela. <laughs> uh, I, I, to give you just the, the real cliff, short Cliff Notes version, uh, there was a recall. So let's go way back, way back, way back. So Hugo Chavez comes in in the uh, – yeah, we're not, we're not live tonight, so – just to let them know that they can watch it. You can watch this all on YouTube. Normally we're live for our Patreon people, but uh, because of uh, the, te because of the zoom, we're, we're just going to stream it on Facebook and Facebook later. So check it out there. So now let's go way back into Venezuelan history into the nineties. So in 61, there was a constitution that was written and then Hugo Chavez comes along in the 90s and starts uh, promising a socialist paradise and the poor are, are getting shafted and I'm going to take all this oil revenue and I'm going to, to do great things for you, socialized medicine, food, all kinds of poor relief, which he ended up doing, which is part of their issue. And uh, he becomes president in 98, 99, I think 96, it, 96. And so he becomes president and uh, in 99, they hold a new referendum and they form the national, their new, new national legislature. And uh, that is what the, what uh, there's a guy who says he's president. Okay. And the guy who says he's president is head of that legislature. Mm -hmm. Now, last year when Maduro Maduro came into power in 2013, when Chavez died, he narrowly won an election, and right as Maduro takes office, uh, Chavez builds up all this poor relief, all this massive spending. They never laid off the spending, but oil prices were really high through the 2000s, and so they could afford it. But then right as Maduro takes over in 2013, oil prices start to plummet. And when that happens, all of a sudden, they can't afford to pay for anything. And so they start printing money. Stop me if this sounds familiar. And right. eventually it tips into hyperinflation. And now we're looking at a country that where the, your average person has lost 28 pounds. It's called the Maduro diet. And uh, there has been a lot of unrest. And he laughs about it. Right. He laughs about it. He thinks yeah. it's hilarious. He's a total sociopath. 
And uh, last year, there was a recall for Maduro. Uh, 86% of people don't support him at this point. Uh, they, they, you know, we'll ask Alina in a moment, but it seems to have always been more of a socialist-leaning country. Uh, and so there was a recall, and there was some dispute over whether or not uh, they had the right signatures. It, it eventually was verified. They did get enough signatures to recall him. They run an election. It's basically a sham election. Uh, and after that, he sets up another assembly. So now there's two competing legislatures in <laughs> Venezuela. Uh, one, one that is beholden to Maduro. The other is the existing 2000 legislature. The Supreme Court there stripped the power from the old legislature and gave it to the new. The, the Supreme Court there has not ruled against uh, Chavez and Maduro since 2005, uh, so it's completely stacked in favor of the existing regime. And so they, they say this election was fine. And Maduro says, I won this recall election. But the old legislature has basically said, no, the president is absent given these pieces of the Constitution. And uh, the, the president of the assembly then assumes the position of leadership in the country and ha hold for about 30 days and then holds another election. And so they're pressing the issue. So what, what the, the leaders of the old assembly are saying is that Maduro cheated, and so therefore he's not a valid president. He wasn't able to be sworn in on January 10th. And so I am the, the old legislature and our president are now in charge. So he's not saying he's president of the country. He's saying that the position of president by Maduro is vacated. And so therefore we need to hold a new election. And once that happened, uh, thanks to people like Marco Rubio, Marco Rubio has been in touch with uh, Guido, who is the president of the old assembly and uh, many other people in Venezuela. He's the Senator from Florida. He is going through, he is really pushing the Trump administration and people like John Bolton, who is the United Nations Secretary, the, the UN um, ambassador during Bush. And you have to think back to Hugo Chavez in the 2000s. Do you remember when he said he spoke right after Bush and he goes, it still smells like sulfur. Like John Bolton and the war and the hawks from the Bush administration have always hated this guy. Uh, the Bolton just declared them part of a Troika of terror, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela. And so John Bolton in the administration is really pushing for intervention. And so the administration is doing several things. We'll, we'll talk about whether or not it's proper, but that's just kind of the Cliff Notes version of what has happened. But I wanna start, I wanna talk to Alina a little bit about what she's heard because Alina, you're, you're Colombian. You came here when you were how old? Five. Okay, so you're five, you, you're not five. You're in your early 20s now. Uh, but you maintain really strong Colombian roots, and you go back a lot, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, feel free to elaborate. Uh, <laughs> so, so when you talk to your friends and family, like what kind of connections do you personally have in your circles to Venezuela? So Venezuela is right next to Colombia. So we've gotten like a lot of refugees. A lot of people have fled from Venezuela into Colombia, which is really interesting because it used to be the opposite way. Like when Venezuela was really prosperous and they were doing well, like a lot of Colombians were going over there because that's where the money was. Yeah, during, um, during the FARC revolutions, uh, it's pr probably about the time that your parents emigrated here. A lot of people were going to Venezuela where they were oil rich. And now I saw a Vox documentary where the guy was interviewing this, this family who had gone to Venezuela. And so when refugees came to Colombia, they said, well, you helped us, let us help you. Yeah. Uh, is there a shared ancestry there? I imagine there probably is. I, I don't know. Okay. Like, I, I, think, know. I think there's something like, did you tell me it was 10% or 10 million people from Venezuela have gone into Colombia? Well, I, the thing that I watched, it said that 10% of the people have fled. I don't know if they've all gone to Colombia. I assume that a lot of them have just because it's right next door and it's probably the easiest. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, I mean, I was just there this summer and like, this has been going on for years. This isn't like a just happened thing. 
So people have been going to Colombia from Venezuela for some time now. And like the people there, I haven't heard anyone be like, oh, why are all these Venezuelans here? Like I, I've heard mostly positive like remarks and like, oh, what are we gonna do? But one thing you don't think about is like people are going into Colombia and they also need papers. So like there, some people are there illegally. Mm. It's kind of the same issue that we're having here. What are the kind of what is the vibe of immigration in Colombia? I mean, is it, you know, from the founding of this country, for whatever reason, for a country of immigrants like America, they've wanted to keep immigrants out. I mean, what is what is the feeling towards new immigrants coming into Colombia? I think that they're open to it. Like, like I said, I haven't heard anything bad. I just I think what I've heard most people say is like, how do we help these people? Like, what is it that we can do? Because it's not like because in Colombia, there's also people that need help. And so it's just like, it's not like there's just the open jobs and like open houses and like all this stuff for them to just come over and be able to take. Yeah, I saw the house that they were all living in was not much more than a lean to. I mean, I don't yeah. really know Colombia, but like for Americans, I think when we think of South America, we think of dirt poor, like literally on dirt, like so can you kind of dispel that myth or is that the truth? Like what? Yeah, that's, I mean, there's areas that are like that, but it's not, it's not really like that. Like you, if you go there right now, that's not what you're going to see. Right. It, it, it's, I think a lot of people have this myth of like, Colombia is just a bunch of houses on dirt made of like planks. <laughs> right. <laughs> And or it, we watch Narcos and that's our frame of reference. Right, right. And that's not even what it's really like so yeah so what are the stories that you've heard from people coming from venezuela to colombia so my aunt my my uncle so his wife is from venezuela and her family most of her family's still there so like i was talking to them because we have a family group chat and everyone's just like worried like what are these people going to be doing like what is it that they can do because up until now they've had like hundreds of people killed that are like in protest and they're, they're just like. In the, the last, in the last like couple of weeks, there's been 700, yeah. 700 people jailed. There's been at least three dozen people that have been killed in protest in Venezuela in the last week or so. Yeah. Do, do Colombians fear or Venezuelans fear a civil war taking place there? They're just scared for like what is going to happen because it's either going to get better or it's going to get worse. Right. So. so I imagine people from South America, like to us, this would be like, like are people from South America just used to this constant regime change and turnover? I don't, I don't know. Like, it's weird because I see the side of like living here and being so immersed in, in the United States, that part of me is just like, oh, how is it really affecting me? But I do have family in Colombia and I do know people from Venezuela. So it's just like, I don't think you realize what these things are until it personally affects you. Like it almost sounds like a made up story. Right. Mm -hmm. And until you have like people that you know affected by it, it's like really hard to grasp. So have you heard a story that like really impacted you? Um, I mean, I have my aunt. She says that like her parents who are obviously older, like they're in the street protesting. And it's just kind of scary to think about all these people feeling like so scared in the street and not only that but like they don't even have food or medicine like it's one thing like if i'm about to go out and like protest but then like i can't imagine doing that on top of like not having food not having like any basic needs met i feel like that just puts them even more in a vulnerable position yeah part mm -hmm. of the problem is that people became dependent in the 2000s and and the aughts like of the, the Venezuelan government giving you free, free food, free medicine, free healthcare, really free education. And then when the government collapsed under Maduro, all of that went away. And so now those people who are dependent on the government, which this is a cautionary tale, uh, when we start talking about socialized medicine in this country, when the government collapses, then all of a sudden people can't afford any of that because right. they've, they've inflated away their money. Right. He was so stuck on his ideology that there was no contingency plan put right. in place. And you've got all these people that 
aren't used to having to go out and they've lost the muscle on how to how to go out and atrophied yeah. right how to create a living for themselves um, correct and it like and this not just happened under maduro this also happened under hugo it was it was happening as yeah. you know hmm? uh, and this is something that was happening the uh, Hugo Chavez multiple times kept raising the minimum wage as he was basically watching the writing on the wall of, hey, this house of cards is falling down. You know, They were making plans of going after different industries because, like, okay, we can't just go on oil. And they were starting to eat up other industries. But a lot of other businesses that was in Venezuela was starting to pull out. And so it just, you know, this was not just like, don't get no pie in the sky idea that, you know, it was just Maduro. If Hugo Chavez would have kept living, you know, everything would have been fine. That is not the case. No, they were too dependent on, on a single source of income. And, and you know, the, the Trump administration today put sanctions on effectively what is Sitgo. If you don't know, Sitgo is owned by... Venezuela. Uh, by Venezuela's yeah. government. And so if you're buying Sitgo gas, you're buying, I you're funding to, Maduro. Yeah. I mean, I was back when I was severely um, libertarian and autistic, <laughs> I used to, I used to go around. If I was running out of fuel, I would, I'd rather push my car to a different gas station than stop at a Sitgo. Well, it was always, it was always weird when I worked at the motor speedway because you'd, you'd interview, you know, Milka Duno or EJ Vizo and they're, they're directly sponsored by the Venezuelan government to run in the Indy 500. And you're like, Ugh. how do you feel about that? <laughs> like, well, so I think Venezuela put all their huevos in one basket. Okay. <laughs> Don't you laugh at that. Alina. That was, that was horrible. <laughs> you apologize to the listeners right now. Um, Aaron, well, we, Aaron's full of dad jokes, Alina. He is a dad, <laughs> but uh, he's, he's, I'm allowed to I have two, yeah. I have a teenager almost. So, what were you going to say, Harry? Oh, I was just going to say that uh, there was other, other larger industries in Venezuela, but like I said, they were they, they watched what they did to the oil industry and just decided to start pulling out or didn't have certain industries there. You know, there was other stuff that happened in Venezuela. Venezuela was like a huge hub for a while, and they just started, you know, but like I said, the businesses started to see the writing on the wall and started to pull out. Uh, and Alina, you're you're shy, so you're gonna have to jump in. You're you're quiet. So if you have something you want to say, then just talk. Okay, and we'll we'll pause for you. I just don't want to be like stereotype, be like, oh, you're just being Hispanic and being loud and obnoxious. That's why you're here. Then why did you wear the gold hoop earrings? <laughs> I always wear these earrings. Point point proved. Thank you, Alina. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so yeah, feel free to jump in. How about Colombia? Because I think what most people know about Colombia is Cocaine. Escobar and and coffee and coffee. Um, Blanca Second deep. best coffee in South America. So, would you like to fight him on that, Alina? No. Okay. <laughs> right, because everyone knows Brazilian coffee is the best. I don't think Brazilian coffee is the best. I've been told Guatemalan coffee is the best. Guatemalan coffee is really good, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the government structure? Because I've seen liberals, there's the weirdest thing going on with the anti war left and anti war libertarians where all of a sudden they've become Maduro fans. Uh, and they, they start bashing, you know, the new Brazilian president who, who's. Who's this scary white right wing monster who, why are we, you know, I saw Ilhan Omar bashing him. It's like, he's been there for less than a month. Like he's, he's already turned it into Nazi Germany. Uh, It's just nonsense. But I've seen Colombia's government get tagged with the, you know, this right wing government, because in a lot of uh, South American history, you have uh, either socialists like Hugo Chavez coming on fighting for the people and then they centralize it for their gang and then give a little bit to the people or it's you know the right wing elites who kind of pool resources for just themselves and then they give a little bit it's not really it doesn't seem that much different but what is the structure in Colombia I know there's been a lot of arguments and back and forth in the Colombian government lately I mean there's a lot happening in Colombia right now uh they're still dealing with the FARC like we just had um a presidential election this past summer and part of that people were scared because one of the like part of the deal was that they were trying to resolve all the conflict with the FARC and part of that was that they got to have someone from their party like run for president 
Can and so who, can you explain who FARC is? The FARC is just like, um, like communist rebels, right? Yeah. They're just like these rebels that they have like a lot of people following them. And like the people that follow the FARC, they're not part of the government. It's just like a whole separate thing. But the reason that they're so big is because all their money, they have it all illegal, like all, all the operations that they run. Right. It's just not good stuff. And so like the people in Colombia, there's a lot of areas that the government doesn't really help. And so the FARC comes in and pretty much says, you either join us or we kill you. And between those options... They don't really have any. That's pretty much how the Taliban has operated in Af- Afghanistan forever as well. Yeah, it's, they, they go into villages and they say, uh, cooperate with us or cooperate with the Americans. And obviously they choose with the people who are going to be there when the Americans leave. Right. They're there and like, they're, like if, if they get anything, it's from, the, it's from the FARC. So they either have something and join them or they have nothing and die. Right. And the Colombian government can't really fight that because they have way more like manpower and more people willing to die for that cause. Mm. I don't like the, the, the military in Colombia isn't like it is here. Like I, I don't hear people in the military there be like proud of being in the military. They're like, Oh, I have to do this. Mm. So like no one wants to fight the FARC. No, yeah. like why? From what I understand is like, they have like more people and more resources. Hmm. Than than the government does. Okay, so it leads it leads to an uneasy tension. So is the govern who who is a, the elected president of Colombia, and are they like some right leaning dictator, as the left is portraying them? Um, not really. Like we, it's weird because like the elections that we had this summer, I guess that in order for someone to be president, they have to get like fifty percent, and the the political parties there aren't like they are here. It's not like just Democrats and it's just Republicans. There's like a lot of different political groups there. Right. And so it breaks it up even more. And so when we had, like, I since I live here, I had to go all the way to Detroit just to register to vote, which is like, what, five hours from where I live? Right. Wow. Then on a different day, I had to go to Chicago to actually vote. And then since no one got like the minimum in order to become president, they had to do a whole nother election. And you have to go to Chicago again. I wasn't even here. I was in Columbia when that happened. So like, I couldn't even vote. Like, (laughs) well, you sent me the the video of all these, cause I didn't really know what was going on. It, It was late last week. And you sent me this video of all these people in the streets and Venezuela and Colombia, their flags, their colors seem similar. Yeah. And so I thought I literally said revolution or soccer <laughs> <laughs> and it could have been either, but it was the Venezuelan protest. I mean, it was a, an absolute mass of people. Yeah. And, you know, I heard the weirdest thing. Uh, I heard the weirdest thing from Daniel McAdams and we'll, we'll kind of get into this. We'll get into the notes here in just a second, but uh, Daniel McAdams, who is the co-host on the Ron Paul uh, podcast, he was on Scott Horton, and I respect Scott Horton a lot. Um, I, I don't know Daniel McAdams to say that I really respect him, but, I mean, if he's with Ron Paul, he's probably cool. But the, the Scott Horton podcast that they, they put out today or yesterday about Venezuela was really weird because they, they almost were trying to make the argument, especially McAdams, less Scott Horton, that Maduro was a legitimately elected person which he wasn't, <laughs> that recall was completely fixed. Uh, and so therefore, why are the people in the streets, why do they get a bigger voice than the people who vote? And I think from a Western perspective, from people who are here, when we look at people, when Alina, when we look at people in the streets in Venezuela and we see that many people, like that's a visual thing. I think this happens anywhere. We look at it in third world countries or developing countries we look at people in the streets and we go, wow, that's really inspiring. When it happens in Western countries like France, oh, this is this has to be stopped. This is outrageous. We can't have this sort of thing. Um, but when you hear the idea that uh, the people who voted are 
And their point was, why do people in the streets have more legitimacy in the minds of Americans than the people who voted? Well, I think we think that all voting is corrupt in South America. I mean, is that is that a valid thing to think? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> really? Well, from what I understand of what happened in Venezuela is like the people that did vote were either bought to vote. I mean, I feel like they say that even here in the in the United States is, oh, those people were were paid to vote this way. So I think that people think that anywhere. Well, they were but literally if you have, using, they were literally in that referendum, they were literally using terrorism to force people to vote in the rural areas for Maduro. And so he won by a pretty healthy margin when he barely squeaked by in the night. Yeah, but I think that you vote. also have to look at how many of, how much of the population actually voted. Okay. Like they're saying that only 20% voted. And so like what happens to the other 80%? Like if we, if 80% of our country was in the streets right now protesting, like, I feel like that would be extremely alarming. Yeah. That's like, what? that's a huge majority of people. So before we start getting into the full nitty gritty details of all this for in our research notes, what do you see a difference in Spanish press when you're reading press that's in Spanish versus American press? Like, do you see a difference? I don't really read that much like uh, Spanish press just because I feel like it's, too much <laughs> what do you mean like, out of all my time spent reading the news like very rarely do i read the spanish press like the only time i hear it is when i'm in colombia and like the news is on or like people in my group chat and my my family in my group chat are like talking about something but i very rarely am like oh let me decide what to do with my spare time oh i know i'll read some news in spanish like right okay i can't say that i i I'm very up to date with that. Like, know very much about that. I thought when you said it was too much that like they, they wave chacalas. Yeah, chanclas. Chanclas. I'll get it by the end. I just yeah. think it's really funny. If you get beat enough with one, you'll remember the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. White people use Hot Wheels tracks. Uh, Hot Wheels tracks in yeah, yeah if, uh, Alina in America. Uh, so when you have kids <laughs> and you're raising them in the American way, you beat them with either a wooden spoon. Yeah. Or a Hot Wheel track. That's the Italian weapon of ass destruction. Yes. So I'm German in Germany and Italian families, in German and Italian American families, it's the wooden spoon. Now in country bumpkin families, I've learned this week that it's Hot Wheels tracks. That oh. and the, I think Hannah's parents had her pick a switch. Pick a switch. Yeah. yeah. Now Harry, what about black families? Um, first off, it's more important to beat the kid with something that they love. You know, you get bonus points for that. So if you take something that they love and then you beat them with it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I was like a, most of the time in uh, black families, it is usually like a, the the comb, oh, shoe, one. shoe, closest thing that you can get, that they can get their hands on usually. And uh, but yeah, yeah. Or belt. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> hashtag don't beat your kids. Um, hashtag peaceful parenting. <laughs> All right. So let's jump into the notes. Let's. Let's give you more of the details about Venezuela. These, this was prepared by Hody Johns, who always does a fantastic job, both on the dailies and on the notes. So if any of the three of you want to jump in and interject something, then, then feel free to speak up uh, as we kind of go through the details of what's happening in Venezuela. So let's start with the crisis. So it's being deemed, Venezuela is deemed as a failure of socialism. And even the New York Times released an article saying, yes, Venezuela is a socialist catastrophe. So if Venezuela took only its oil production and sold it on the market, uh, sold it on the market and split amongst all of its citizens, their citizens would be the fourth richest people in the world. That is, n that is with no other form of economic gain. That's how much oil there is in Venezuela. Uh, they have a, a type of crude, which we'll get into the, the actual crude and the, and the oil, because I've seen, you know, this is a, a coup for oil, which is not necessarily the case in my opinion, but we'll talk about that. It's just interesting that we're, we're so interested in Venezuela right now. <laughs> it's so hot right now. Yeah, with all the oil there. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> they need freedom, Aaron. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Got to bring their freedoms. So, instead, they are now among the poorest, despite all of that wealth. Of all the countries outside of Africa, uh, this is why I wish I had my printed notes. It keeps switching on me. I'm Only, turning into full boomer right now. Yeah. Only Afghanistan. 
worse standard of living. Yeah, so Afghanistan is even poorer outside of Africa. So Africa obviously has the poorest countries. And Honduras even topped Venezuela in, in shelter, food, and water supplies. Are you where Haiti? You go to Haiti. No. Yeah, I'm not a catracho. <laughs> okay. Uh, they have begun rationing toothpaste. It's, it's that severe down in Venezuela. They've begun to print money to account for their debts. And since 2000, their inflation rate had never been above 40%. And in 2018, it was a hundred, a million, it was 1.3 million percent. I've seen 10 million percent. I've seen 20 million percent by some estimates, but I think it's 10 million percent uh, inflation, according to the World Bank at some points. So it's like Zimbabwe. It, yeah. So Zimbabwe is like, like sextillion percent at this point oil barrels with pennies yeah so the economy is crumbling and for the last five years their gdp has been negative a feat even marveled by the poorest countries in the world and for the last three years their gdp has lost 16 and 17 percent every single year that's the gross domestic gross domestic product uh to put that into perspective gdp measures stuff and services Imagine that you lost 50% of everything you owned over the last three years, and that is what the citizens are going through. Uh, think of it as individuals have lost 50% of their stuff, their valuables, their ability to make money, their, their goods and services. Um, the USA has actually become a net oil exporter over the last year, and without their favorite buyer, Venezuela has had to sell to countries that offer far less than the U.S. did. Uh, in American fashion, the U.S. only put sanctions on Venezuela after they no longer needed their oil. Um, now, coincidence, total yeah. coincidence. So they have a heavy crude that is only refinable by a Coke plant in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, Canada has a similar kind of oil. And so the, the Coke, the idea that this is for oil, uh, I'm sure it may play a factor, but at the end of the day, the Coke brothers have a fairly good relationship with the Venezuelan government because they need the oil, they have the plant, and Maduro needs to sell the oil. So, you know, I don't, I don't think the Coke brothers are hanging out with Donald Trump. They, they pretty much hate each other, uh, arguing that we need to do this for oil. So sometimes I think these cliches, these anti-war cliches, don't actually get to the truth and probably do a bit of a disservice. I mean, how much do you guys think that uh, oil plays, oil wealth factors into this? Well, I think it has to be the, the driving factor for why, you know, businesses are even interested in Venezuela right now. I mean, and I think that there's a rampant corporatism mm -hmm. involved in, in trying to get this. I'm, I'm hesitant to say this new guy is going to be better than Maduro. <laughs> I mean, I, why, what is it? Guido. Guido. Yeah. yeah. Guido. I don't know. Not hey, Guido. <laughs> but. I mean, hey, Guido. <laughs> why, why is he the guy, you know? Well, well and, that's, that's sort who, of the, yeah. You know, who's who's propping him up, who's supporting him. That's actually the feeling in Venezuela. They're, the eighty six percent of people want to get rid of Maduro, but they're resentful. Uh, and Alina, maybe you can speak to this a little bit. They're resentful of Donald Trump in the United States interfering in this in any way, shape, or form. And as a result, hesitant to buy into whatever Guido might be selling. It's it seems like Groundhog's Day. I don't know. What I what I understand is Guido right now is just stepping in until they figure it out because he's the head of the national assembly right and so since there's no legitimate president i from what i understand is like in their constitution that's who steps in until they have that seat filled right so he's 35 we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about him here in just a moment but let's well, talk about a little bit of the starvation well, go ahead with the, with the oil thing right it's not it's completely not about the oil though because the venezuelan government has destroyed their oil producing capacity over the years as well yes it's a it's a heavier harder crude They're, they also didn't put the money into their plants so their plants that get it to get it on the boats that that has been destroyed has not been reinvested into the boats that uh the shipping boats that can ship the crew barely pass safety inspection to go through a lot of different international uh, channels. So they have to go around into different um, asteroids because their boats don't pass inspection or cannot travel the sea to get to the United States either. So yeah, it's a I, huge I, expense. 
And Harry, I really, like when I dig into the details of this, it doesn't seem like the American government's getting a lot out of the oil of Venezuela. And so, so I, I know we kind of all buy, listen, we've invaded because of the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, I, I, I don't think we're really going to talk about it in the notes, but the Monroe Doctrine essentially came about under James Monroe, the last of the founding presidents. And it was the idea that the Americans should have, uh, should have control of the Western Hemisphere. And it was at a time when America was very, uh, it was weak. I mean, you know, it's the last of the founding presidents. The War of 1812 hadn't gone all that well. There wasn't really a military. And so the Monroe Doctrine was basically, we need to keep any European power out of our hemisphere because it threatens our security. And the Monroe Doctrine has been used to justify 41 different interventions in South American and Central American countries. And so it, it is very easy for us to look at a situation like this and just kind of go, well, history is repeating itself. But we do have to kind of dig into the details here and see exactly what might be taking place. Let's not jump the gun. Let's not say that, that we're staging a military coup. There's some mm -hmm. evidence that obviously John Bolton would like to. But we're not at that point yet. And so is it, a, is it a coup so the American government and the CIA can take over oil? I'm not seeing a lot of evidence as of right now that that's what's taking place. I'm not so naive as to think that this person, Guido, is doing any of this by himself. Obviously, uh, Marco Rubio is involved, John Bolton, yeah. uh, Pompeo, the Trump administration are all involved in this. But we, I don't see a lot of benefit necessarily for – the, the Americans to have to tip a country into civil war. I think um, there was an opportunity there. Or, you know, they we've obviously seen an opportunity to finally get rid of get Maduro. rid of this regime. And they yes. whispered in yeah. Guido's ear, "Hey, you know, you take the leap, we'll support you." Right, and you know, I think right. that's absolutely and that's it. Yeah, several other countries besides the U.S. Yeah, Canada was actually the one who was leading yeah. the the Russia, conversations about Russia. all this. Yeah. 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 China's kind of playing the back seat because Venezuela owes them so much money yeah. and they stand no real benefit to to uh, get rid of the communist leader. There. China and Russia want to get their money back because they've yeah. loaned a lot of money to the Maduro government. So let's jump back into what's happening in Venezuela because we're so excited to talk about a coup that we're, we're jumping ahead in our notes here. <laughs> My fault. Um, who doesn't love a good coup? Uh, so... Uh, so the starvation and the the if you're living in Venezuela, it's very bad. So I took an Uber ride in Orlando uh, this year, and I I had an Uber driver from Venezuela, and I got so into him telling his story that we got totally lost and almost missed our dinner. Uh, he was a former dentist, and he was a fairly well off person who was in an opposition party. He supported the opposition party against Maduro, and he had to flee. He had to flee the country. Uh, he was driving an Uber Uber car in Orlando in uh, in 2018 instead of practicing. But he said, you know, 50 percent of the country they're just eating trash. They're literally eating trash to survive. It is uh, it, it is a very serious humanitarian humanitarian crisis that's happening there. Eight out of 10 Venezuelans report eating less because they are either broke or the rationing has decreased. Six out of 10 Venezuelans reporting, report going to bed hungry consistently. The government has begun to cut down on food rations and even available purchase options. Over the last four years, cornmeal, bread, pasta, vegetables, dairy, and fruit have all seen double-digit percentage cutbacks. Uh, beans and yucca, which is like a potato, dispersion has nearly doubled to compensate for this. So a lot of beans and a lot of yucca. Is it yucca? How do you say that? Yucca. Yucca. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, Alina, when I say they're, they're cutting back on cornmeal and, yeah. bread and pasta, vegetables, dairy, I mean, that's, these are staple items. Yeah, beans and rice. Yeah. Um, so nine out of 10 people can't afford even the rationed food. But the thing is, like, I've been hearing that people don't have food for years. Really? Yeah. Like, I've been for at least, I don't even know, maybe two or three years, maybe even more. Like, I, it just keeps getting worse. I, and I, in my head, I'm thinking, like, how can you cut back on nothing? Like, what? Mm -hmm. I don't even know how these people. 
how they're even surviving at this point. Yeah. Um, n- next is medicine. The waiting list, even for life-saving treatments, are prohibitively long, even approaching years. And a particularly sad twist of fate, Venezuela was the first country to eliminate malaria in 1961. Uh, now in 2019, 10 of their 24 states have widespread outbreaks. And they're projected to have 1 million cases in 2019. Malaria is the number one killer of people in the world, which is why Bill Gates took it on. Alina, you were going to say something? Well, I, I saw a video and it was talking about how they don't even have vaccines. So people are getting like polio. Oh, Wow. Wow. That's, that's, I mean, you've done a lot of work in Haiti, Aaron. I mean, it sounds a lot like what you've described in Haiti. Yeah. I mean, if not worse, yeah. sounds like, I mean, I mean, there's parts of Haiti that obviously aren't as bad. Right. Um, and it seems like it's gotten better over the years. I haven't been there in a few years, but I've been there, you know, over 20 times. Right. And started going when I was 17. But yeah, I mean, the roads, the conditions of people's houses. And I, I think, capitalism is uh, playing a major role in bringing um, a better quality of life right. even to the poor the poorest of the world um, they have cell phones in a way to communicate now they can see the outside world yeah once you br- and, remove an authoritarian like Duvalier yeah and, yeah and so you know you remove that veil like you have here between your podcast studio and the kitchen <laughs> um, this is a multi-million dollar studio sir. and <laughs> You know, so people can communicate and they can learn English and, you know, through Facebook Messenger and things right. like that. I think I, I've seen their, their quality of life get at least twice. I mean, in the last better. 10 years, last 10 years, way yeah. better than it used to be. Because, I mean, the average cell phone is just a few dollars a, a, a month or whatever <laughs> down there. And they're, I was surprised oh, wow. when I went there. They're, they have cricket? No, their speed. Yeah, come on. <laughs> their speed is much faster even than ours in some places. <laughs> Like 4G. Jeez. Yeah. So it's great. Well, that's uh, as it's not how it's supposed to be. We're America. Gosh darn. It. <laughs> um, so they're More fa- proof that the FCC sucks. Yes. So to to Harry's point, they're falling behind on oil production. Um, we've had innovations in fracking and shale. So we've become a net oil exporter um, with government control. Their energy department, Venezuela, overseas gathering oil and they have not yet explored either of these advancements and they've had declining in barrels of oil uh, since 2000. Now the the places that have oil have always been government land for lack of a better word. It was always public land because these are places that nobody ever lived so it wasn't necessarily a public a private property paradise to begin with. Um, so so it's always kind of been in the government's control and obviously the governments there have fought over these resources. Uh, Now you move on to the population declining. So leaving Venezuela unannounced is illegal. Over 3 million of them have managed to escape with so much of their population leaving, declining or having record number of infants die at childbirth. The debt can no longer comfortably expand based on population. Most citizens knowing that most infants will starve to death have stopped having kids which is a very uh, troubling and sad realization. Um, So let's move on to the coup and give you some notes on the coup. So the incumbent president is Nicolas Maduro. Uh, He was appointed essentially on the death of Chavez when he died of cancer. He, He was his chosen successor. He narrowly won victory in 2013. Um, And, He is supported by Russia, China, Iran, Turkey, Cuba, Mexico, and the UN. So a real killer's row of model world citizens there. Uh, Russia especially backs Maduro because he sells them a lot of weapons, including two nuclear bombers. Nuclear, these two bombers that Russia just delivered to them have nuclear capabilities is what I'm trying to say. Ouster Juan Guaido, excuse me, Guaido, is supported by Canada, the U.S., the U.K., Brazil, Peru, Chile, and Argentina. In a nutshell, under the Constitution of Venezuela, the President of the National Assembly may step in as President temporarily in the middle of a controversy over who should be the President. Maduro's election was seen as rigged, and even the U.N. that backs Maduro states the election was a sham. This is all still based on his 2013 election. He's slated for a new election in 2013. 
Uh, so he was originally elect elected in 2013, and then a few months ago he won a recall vote. Um, under undercover researchers found in the quote in Venezuelan case in the Venezuelan case where the current president was elected by plurality voting, the systematic distortion of voting behavior in small electoral units was outcome determinative. So essentially, this examination found that rural areas with less oversight were using intimidation and fraud to sway the vote. Outcome, outcome determinative is a fancy way of saying it changed the result. So it was basically a sham election that got him elected in the first place in 2013, and especially in that referendum. Um, the legislative body swore Guido in as president on the 23rd of January until an investigation could be completed. Uh, the constitutional starting date for the president and for all of these legislators was January 10th. Uh, Maduro has refused to allow the matter to be investigated. Now, as we have said, he's arrested 700 people who are protesting or involved in the opposition party in just the last couple of weeks and 36 people have been killed in Venezuela, which is not something that has actually been highlighted uh, by a lot of people, but is of note to begin with. Uh, any other comments? I want to stop there just so if you want to interrupt. Okay, well, I'll interrupt. I, yeah, go ahead, uh, ladies first. When I was talking to my aunt about this, and she's from Venezuela, she was like, she was just really sad because she's saying that a lot of the the people that are getting killed are like teenagers or young people too. And like I, when I was replying to her, I was like, Oh my gosh, that's crazy. And she's like, it's not just crazy. Alina, it's sad. Like right. children are dying. And right. it's like, I think that you forget what that's like where we live. We're just so fortunate that we don't, these things are just stories that we're reading. Like these things are just, we're just being informed about other people and what they're going through like we're not going through something like this and so i feel like when we look at it it's more of like we're looking at facts and we're trying to read statistics and we forget that these are just humans and yeah no matter why this is happening or how this is happening like people are losing their lives and children are losing their lives yeah people who you look at antifa it's mostly young people because people are attracted to fighting young people especially are attracted to fighting power so it's obviously going to be a lot of younger people because they're the ones who feel like they have absolutely no hope, no future, mm -hmm. because they have no roots. Harry, what were you going to say? Okay. I want to go back to the point when they were talking about the, uh, the, the nuclear-capable bombers. Let's look at that. Because that was like a lot of buzzword. That's a lot of like scare tactic. Like this is what's going on in Venezuela. What, in reality, Russia sent them two junky you know, air, <laughs> crap from the Soviet Union air and junk. It's like, yeah, so some of the stuff we got out back. That's nope. what they sent them. I, I don't know if you know that for a fact, but the Reuters article that I read, Russia has supplied them with a bunch of planes and bombers, and, and Maduro had a, a military parade on Sunday mm -hmm. uh, to show off a lot of this new equipment that he's bought that Russia has sent, has sold to them. Yeah, you know, I see that, but like the nuclear capability, you would have to first. You have to have a nuke to even like. It's basically like this thing has the capability of putting one on the plane and delivering it. But all of those things were developed in like the seventies and the eighties. That's what yeah. I'm saying. They, Russia hasn't gone out and actually built new nuclear aircraft. They haven't done that. Just like right. the United States really haven't either. Okay. So the new aircrafts are they're, they're probably newer tech, but like United States is still selling and flying F-A-16 F and stuff like that. They're not giving people F-22s. All right, let's, so let's talk about America's interest, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap up and kind of give a little bit of analysis on this. So America's interest, uh, so essentially risking our status with the UN uh, is of concern to the American government. And let's be honest, uh, Hody, our researcher, writes, we financed terrorist groups and usurpers before, and the UN didn't do anything last time. Uh, the United States have given financial support to permanent, the permanent presidency of Guido, Guido. America helped create part of the crisis to begin with by placing sanctions and trade restrictions on Venezuela and doubled down today on sanctions against their main source of income. 
essentially they put uh, sanctions on Sitgo and then they have to pay at the borders. And so all of the money goes into a, a locked account essentially. And so the, the United States government is not going to give that money to Maduro. They're going to hold on to it. Maduro has tried to get his gold, all of the nation's resources from the Bank of England, the bank, uh, the country of Brit, the United Kingdom, basically said it's up to the Bank of England what they'd like to do with the money. Uh, and there have been a lot of different countries placing sanctions on Venezuela just in the last week, trying to make sure that if he flees, he doesn't take all of the money with him, like Gaddafi or some of these other guys have done. You know, when they leave the, the power of their country, they take all of the resources or the gold with them. Um, I think Mubarak had done that in Egypt. And so that's a lot of what the sanctions are about at the moment. Um, so like Honduras, the U.S. regulated their trade and when they collapsed, installed someone friendly to U.S. interests. If you want to hear about another instance, go to Honduras. And you, you will in the uh, Wall Dailies. We did an episode on Honduras because that's where a lot of the the caravan was coming from. Remember? Well, why is that happening? Because the United States created several different economic situations that would collapse a regime, install someone friendly, and then things turn into a civil war. Uh, and that's certainly an outcome that could happen here. Now, a Colombian drone attempted to kill Maduro in 2018. Now, he immediately believed the U.S. government was behind the attack. Uh, Secretary of State Pompeo denied our involvement. With both sides spewing lies on every other issue, the listener can decide what really happened, and nobody really knows. Uh, some said the military tried to kill him, Colombia tried to kill him, the United States tried to kill him, but it definitely escalated the tensions between U.S. and Venezuela. Now, Alina, did you personally try to kill Maduro? Was this your drone? I think she's frozen. I was. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you died. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, they poisoned her. What did you say? No, uh, we were talking about this Colombian drone that tried to kill Maduro last year. She's frozen. She's frozen again. All right, we'll move on. Yeah. That's classified uh, information, clearly. She, clearly, the, the Colombian government has gotten to her phone. Uh, the Trump administration has its eye on Venezuela. From a golf course, Trump casually has mentioned a military option to get rid of him. Rex Tillerson used to say he looked favorably on an ouster for Maduro. Uh, getting Guido in might mean avoid. Uh, getting Guido in might mean avoiding an election, which means a U.S. ally for the foreseeable future in that country. And the Trump administration has already threatened to sanction anybody who might run against Guido and win. Now. Here's the, th the thing about when it comes to Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. And I mean, Venezuela has always been the, th the thorn in the side of the U.S. government when it comes to the Monroe Doctrine. A big reason why Hugo Chavez came to power, he was a very charismatic person, but his message was the, the World Bank and the IMF and the United States government and their banks and the U.N., they come into these African and South American countries they take our resources, they give us these bullcrap loans, and they basically subjugate our people, take our resources, and keep us poor. And I am going to take the resources that we are blessed with in Venezuela and fight the devil, the United States. You hear a lot of this rhetoric taking place uh, in uh, Venezuela at the moment. See, the, the devil's coming in trying to usurp us. This is imperialism. They're doing it again. Uh, Maduro is setting up a choice for the military because Guido is saying to the military, don't kill your fellow citizens. I order you not to fire. Maduro is saying you either are with us or against us. You are either a traitor and we will, we, when we win this, we will punish you or you're with us, the military, because they have been set up with a set of financial incentives. They are all behind Maduro. Uh, so, the military. The, this isn't like um, th th this isn't like uh, Colombia, for example, where you have an army and you have the FARC. You don't have two military powers in the country of Venezuela. You have the military, and it's and it's a pretty robust military, and it's certainly not a military that the United States would want to get into a fight with. Um, and I don't think that 
despite what John Bolton's pad said, where it said 5,000 troops in Colombia, I don't know that he necessarily meant that he was going to put 5,000 American troops in Colombia. Uh, he, he basically, this photo was taken of Bolton and, and he had his yellow pad towards the cameras and written on it said 5,000 troops in Colombia. Well, that could mean 5,000 Colombian troops. That could mean 5,000 American troops. That could mean uh, uh, 5,000 UN peacekeepers. Who knows what that might mean? Um, he says that that was just a misunderstanding, which mean, means that it's probably United States troops and he's trying to cover his ass. So there's a lot of different variables. And part of the problem is that when the United States starts picking winners like they're doing with Guido and people in the government, even Bernie Sanders, start lining up behind the challenger, what that does to the people in those countries is it gives them a boost. And they all think that the United States will commit troops. This happened in Syria. This has happened in almost every country. As, as I've been an adult and watching this, I have noticed that the United States morally gets behind a Guido and that leads the people in the country that are with Guido to think that the United States will have their back at all cost, including military intervention. So they get really far ahead of themselves and then the United States doesn't deliver on it. Their morale collapses and then the Maduros clamp down tighter. People have poked their head out of the, the sand. They start getting decapitated literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. And then the situation just becomes even worse and even bloodier because the United States has tried to pick a winner. Um, that is a, a serious problem with this. Obviously, no one looks at this situation. That's why I was absolutely stunned by what I heard on the Scott Horton show. When, when I hear someone like McAdams basically saying, you know, Maduro is the duly elected president of Venezuela. How dare we? And he's kind of like in a veiled way supporting Maduro, even though it's, it's, it's not what he was doing, but it comes across that way. But there's always like this weird thing with the, the Ron Paul show right now, where it's like, Russia is not bad. China is not bad. You know, McAdams in this interview basically said, well, China and Russia say the election was fine. So it's disputed at best. And I sit there going, China and Russia are your, are like, mm. you hate, you believe China and Russia over the United States government? Like, I don't know what you're drinking, man, but, like, I believe my government's corrupt, but I don't see a morally superior China and Russia. <laughs> no. um, so I, I think we are, we're falling into a trap where, like, we are so against military intervention that we're tiptoeing into saying Maduro's okay and that is absolutely not a morally defensible position in any way, shape, or form. When you look at what has happened in Venezuela, and I'm sure you guys agree, there's no way that you can look at what Maduro has done and how he has acted and see anything other than an absolute corrupt, murderous authoritarian who needs to go. Now, should we be involved in that? That's for the listener to decide. I say no, because we mess it up worse. But... I don't think that Maduro is somebody that you should ever even veil in a veiled way try to say is, is a, a legitimate person to rule over people. No. I think we're going to leave a vacuum there, and, and Guido's not going to be the guy that fills it. It's right. going to be a, probably a worse dictator than what they have now, mm -hmm. you know, because I think the economic situation is, is going to get worse before it gets better. And uh, whoever fills that, spot is going to uh you know i mean ultimately is is going to be um left holding the bag so to yeah. speak so so to speak harry yeah well the other thing is uh, the, how can i put this uh hugo chavez's daughter has already like exited the country a while back with millions of money and have already raided that place. So right. it's, it has been, the places already have been looted. You know, it's, so it's, how can I put it? It's, it's sad to watch it keep happening because it, it, it's just this slow death that has just been spiraling around just watching Venezuela just circle the drain for what it seems like, what, seven, seven years now? 
I, I feel like it's been like seven years. I've been watching like all the like the crap show of Venezuela for for I think close to the well, decade of just watching it go down. So there was an article in Cato today that kind of Juan Carlos Hidalgo made made a point. Uh, this is a really good article with five misconceptions about what's going on. Um, you know, and one of the points, the, one of the misconceptions, quote, the opposition is encouraging the armed forces to launch a coup. Uh, he writes, the coup took place years ago and it was carried out by Maduro with the active involvement of the armed forces. In 2017, Maduro installed a puppet constitution, constituent assembly subverting the requirements established in the constitution. Since then, that assembly has taken away all the powers of the legitimately elected National Assembly. The Supreme Court is under such complete control of the regime that since 2005, it hasn't once ruled against the executive. What the opposition is encouraging is for the armed forces to act in accordance to the Constitution. So this writer at the, the Cato Institute is basically saying, this isn't, a, this isn't about inciting a coup, this is about fighting a coup. And then he goes on to basically say that nations have a legitimate right to recognize the legitimate government that they're going to deal with. It doesn't necessarily mean that the United States diplomatically is staging a coup. It means that they're going to talk to the people that are more legitimate, and that is Guido, in this writer's opinion, than Maduro. True, uh, because like Maduro has did several different things in the last, like you said, like two or three years against the con the written constitution of Venezuela to ke right. keep himself in power and to give himself more power, and he actually elected separate different like of his own like his own special government. And I believe we talked. I believe we talked about that. Uh, it was last year actually when um, Maduro did it enact its own its his own Senate basically. Yeah. I forget what episode that is, but yes, we, we talked about that last year. Right. And it's, and it just, like I said, it's, so this new government and everyone's really, like, it's kind of like, so since he did this, crossed his own constitution, they seem more legitimate at that point. Right. Alina, what do you think? Well, I'm just thinking about like the comments of being like, when you say you don't think that the U.S. should help. And I don't know how I feel about that, but whenever you guys say like, oh, that country's already looted, it almost makes me think like, oh, they don't, we don't have anything to gain from it. And so then it's not even worth helping. And it kind of, I don't know, I feel like that's a really bad message to put out there. Because at the end of the day, the way I see it, it's just these are people and we see these people suffering. And like, if I personally could do something to help, I would want to, if that makes sense. Like when you say it's going to get worse, so do we just watch? Like, well, uh, let me go because here's where here's where I I look at this, and I even said in a group chat the, the other day, I go, this is when it's a shitty time to be a libertarian, because this is one of those times where your principles conflict with exactly what you're talking about, Alina where you want to do something you want to help. And so I, I, I'm, I don't hold these beliefs because I'm selfish and I don't want us to do something because I don't think that it will, um, that helping doesn't benefit us. Mm -hmm. um, I look at it in the way that you look at the track record of success. Helping has been the problem in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. When, when you look at these 41 different, there was a Colombian professor, uh, I'd, I'd have to look this up real quick, but he basically outlined the 41 different, um, let me just look at, look at this real quick. Do, do, do. All right. Well, it's the same thing with the um, American Revolution when they fought off their uh, oppressive um, regi regime. Um, they did get help from the French, but the French only did it because do a gigantic middle finger to the English and yeah, so John H. Coatsworth uh, wrote an article. I'll put it in the show notes, United States Interve Inter Interventions. And Coatsworth basically is a Columbia professor, that Columbia University professor, uh, that outlined the 41 different interventions that the United States has instituted. And when you look at the track record of the United States intervening in South America, 
it hasn't been very successful <laughs> mm-hmm. and we tend to make things worse. It's just like I was talking about a little bit ago where when you are as a nation not going to follow through on the things that you promised to these opposition parties, you end up getting them slaughtered. The United States is so divided politically, especially, especially after Iraq, that the stomach is not there nationally to take on more responsibility in other countries, A, because we can't really afford it at this point, and B, because we don't feel like we're helping. Like, at what, what, what level do you intervene in, a, in another nation? I don't have, when I look at this situation, if, if the surface of information that we have in front of our face is just that we have accepted a new set of diplomats from a country at, while they're working out their constitutional issues, then I don't necessarily have a problem with the, the president accepting a new a new delegation right if the cia is currently in in venezuela and propping up someone who is uh going to be a uh, pinochet you know chile is a great example the the united states propped up this right-wing dictator in chile that started throwing people out of his opposition out of helicopters uh so aaron's in favor <laughs> of that but um, just joking. <laughs> so part of the part of the argument that people like Chavez have had is that when the United States has supported opposition in Latin American countries, we're choosing the right wing people who are just enriching the um, elite in that country, and they're doing nothing for the people. They're not actually supporting the Democrats in those, and, not, and I don't mean the Democratic Party, but the people who believe in democracy in those countries. We're supporting people who become dictators. And so by the United States helping, we've made a lot of bad choices. And so I think that's why, from an American standpoint, there's a lot of hesitation on my part to say, let's get involved, because our government picks really bad people for countries like your, your home country. You know, we're, we're not good at helping other countries. If you look at Iraq, if you look at Egypt, if you look at uh, to, uh, Libya, if you look at uh, Afghanistan, the track record of America, quote unquote, helping is not very good. And at some point, it has to be up to, it's just amazing to see all these people who are mad about Russia interfering in our election, screaming for us to intervene in the affairs of other countries. Like, I, I don't know if that really resonates with you, Alina, but that's why I look at it because I agree with you. Like you look at people suffering and you go, I want to help them. But having studied how we help them, we tend to put people in power that benefit the United States government and not the people of those countries. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, if this is like your first time hearing about what's happening in Venezuela, I would hope that your first reaction is like sympathy and like feeling bad for these people and not necessarily to like sit there and think of like, Oh, well they did this wrong and they, this is happening to them because they're socialists. They, like, yeah. And like, it's really easy to just point fingers and be like, Oh, it's this, it's this person's fault or they did it because they did this wrong. When at the end of the day, they're just people. And um, I don't know, like, no, it's I get weird. exactly what you're saying. And yeah. let me give you an illustration. But, when I listen to libertarian podcasts about this subject, it's a lot of smirky. The human element it, is it, removed. It, right. Yeah. It's smirky cliches about how libertarians are morally superior on these issues. And we told you so. We told you so. Yeah. And there isn't really a lot of empathy for the people there. I think it's a great point that libertarians a lot of times miss. Yeah. And, and you could have your empathy. And like I said, I've been watching the situation, you know, and so it, it's hard not to say like, oh, see, look, it's finally happening. But you did touch on the one point that Venezuela's last great resource right now is its people. Its people are highly educated, highly motivated to do things. That is the best resource Venezuela has right now. They are. They have set up tons of different factories. A lot of people know how to work these machines. That what they need is the capital investment from uh, a, a capitalist system to go back and invest and get get them to diversify diversify their, the economy. That's what's holding them back. So I don't want you to think that when I said that place was looted, it was looted monetarily. That's what I'm talking about. But for people, the human element that's there, that's the richest thing that they have. 
because the Coca Cola bottle there was a there was a there's a huge massive Coca Cola bottling company there uh, plant in Venezuela. It's huge. It's massive. Tons of equipment and machines are there, but it's inoperable right now because the Venezuelan government took it over. Alina. Yeah, I I don't know. I just like maybe it just makes me feel different just because like I know people there mm -hmm. and like I have a hard time just separating this as just another story that's going to come and go just because I have been seeing it for years and I ha like even though it's like not necessarily immediate family but like even if my family's affected I feel like it's affecting me as well and so I, I'm not saying like I have the answers and like this is what we should do. Like I said, when I first started talking, it's like I'm not saying that I think we should go in or we shouldn't go in. Like I haven't made up my mind. I just like, especially like talking to this group of libertarians, like you said, sometimes I feel like they forget that they're humans. And like, I'm not saying that I don't like to joke because like I feel like <laughs> I don't. I'm like trying to be serious, but at the same Alina, time, like, Alina and I would never kill ourselves, but our favorite are suicide memes. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but like, it's just easy to just talk about this for a little bit and then make memes and then make jokes and then just forget about it because it's not affecting our day to day. Next thing up on the news cycle and right. yeah. filter it out. Because the first, time. I've had a lot of people come up to me and be like, oh, what's happening? What's happening? Like what just happened in Venezuela? I think it's because it hasn't been talked about in the United States, like for the U S and for most people, like this is the first time they're hearing about it, but it's been going on. Like, I think it's a great point and a great reminder. And, and it's something that we always try to keep in mind when you hear, when you hear things in the news, that's happening to real people, like even judge Kavanaugh, you can, or Roger Stone, like people who are the villain in the, in the news cycle, like they're human beings with emotions and feelings. And so like, what, what must they be feeling? Or, you know, the people of Venezuela, like, oh, look at those idiots who chose socialism. Look, haha, -ha, don't you get... But, like, there's reasons why everybody makes the choices that they make. And a lot of times, I mean, we, we have our biggest group of people that support We Are Libertarians on our Facebook page are soldiers. Veterans are the number one job of people that like the We Are Libertarians Facebook page. You know why? It's because those people have had to have these conversations and they're the ones who are actually fighting the wars and they're the ones who are dealing with the mm -hmm. government and they're the ones who like were 18 or 19 in a crummy financial situation and signed up for the military and got in there and realized what a cluster it was. And then somewhere along the line fell out of, out of uh, the scales fell from their eyes and they started to go, there has to be a better way. They find libertarianism. And then those people just go, I don't know that the libertarians, I believe the things that they believe, but man, when I see the dead soldier memes, I don't know that I can be with these people. Uh, you know, those are the black and yellow. No, it's not, man. It's, really? it's, it's so much more. It's so many more libertarians. Like if you see the people who like, there's one guy that I really think is funny and has good memes, but he puts up a dead cop meme about once a day and you just go, dude, yeah. you, you're not winning hearts and minds. You're just taking somebody who could be an ally who, if you talk yeah, to them. Yeah, it's like, who hurt you? <laughs> right. You <know? laughs> right. Like, <laughs> I mean, the Free Talk Live guys in Keene, New Hampshire, started meeting with the police officers in their local town and over a series of coffee dates convinced most of the police department to quit. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. because they talked to them like they were human beings. So I don't think that it's necessarily that you live and breathe it and that makes you different, Alina. I think it's that you just gave us a really good reminder that you're you should approach every story with empathy and realize like the Venezuelans and every time you post one of those memes and you kind of joke about it, realize that there are real people who are starving and you know, th there has to be some sort of resolution for those people. Yeah. So, and that, that, that's the hardest part, I think, because you look at this and you go, I don't want this socialist robbing these people and taking them over. So you want to do something. You want to help. Exactly. You know, your empathy is triggered. And, and I think a lot of people go, well, military intervention or propping up another regime, that's the thing to do. But at the end of the day, you have to look at the results of that. 
And that's not the most empathetic thing you can do because it just brings more misery for these people. Like yeah. it, it's, it, it sucks. It's one of the hardest things about being a libertarian. And how did, that. Go ahead, Harry. I was going to say, and how did socialism get to Venezuela? Another white European trying to help somebody? That's how, <laughs> that's how socialism got there, okay? No, it's, it's true. People going down there to help. Well, and that's a big reason why you saw Marxism and, and the, USSS, the USSSSR. Uh, the Soviets basically started taking over, you know, Asian countries and uh, basically populations of color. Let's put it that way. In uh, across the globe, the reason that um, they turned to the Soviets is because it was a natural counterbalance to colonialism, to imperialism, and so neo-imperialism. When we're using the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, uh, look up the John Perkins book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Uh, that's, that's just a new version of it. You know, you take a, com a country like Nigeria or Venezuela and you, you loan them to build infrastructure. You loan them all this money to build infrastructure and then they can't afford to pay the loans back. And then all of a sudden they're just basically slaves to these payments. So I think Maduro's henchmen are at the door. Honestly, go lock the door, please. <laughs> so there's somebody's knocking at the door, Harry. We're not even live streaming. Uh, uh oh, uh oh, here it comes. It's I bet it's Aaron. Battery ram. He Maybe legitimately he legitimately thinks that we should call the police every time we live stream. Why? Because if we start a live stream, Alina, then someone might might prank us. And send, uh, say that we have drugs here, and then they'll have a SWAT team kill well, us. Now they will, for sure. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now they will. Harry. <laughs> I, I like how he says us. I like how the, he, they, he says the word, the cops will kill us. Okay. I like, how he says, I like how he says that. Well, I'm, I'm harboring a known African American, so. <laughs> you know. Harry was laughing at that. Let, let the record state that he had muted his channel and he was laughing. Unmute yourself so people know that that was a joke. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> Making me look racist. I'm not racist. I love, I have a black friend and a Colombian friend, right, Alina? Yeah, very diverse. Very diverse. And Aaron, he's, he's got uh, hillbilly jeans. Strong Appalachian roots. Oh my gosh, Alina! He does. He went on. He got back on keto. He lost. Oh, he lost twenty pounds in a week. He went to CrossFit once, and got six pack. That's how. That's how aggressive his hillbilly jeans are. Yeah. Well, it was just you know, quit the bush light. <laughs> I guess if you don't drink like twelve to fourteen a day, <laughs> if you don't drink seven hundred and seventy-eight thousand beers a year. Yeah. I, it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much it was, but it was a lot. And my IRA has taken a huge hit, by the way. Yeah, he was invest he was vested in uh, Anheuser Busch and Bev. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to retire at forty two, only a few more years ago. Hey. All right. So you know what a dirty thirty a thirty rack of bush light is? How much? It's a bushel. It's called a bushel. No, I'm turning your mic off. That's enough. No more, no more jokes. <laughs> oh, goodness. That's awful. No. Uh, uh, they didn't yeah. even recognize Write that one down. The, Alina, you didn't even recognize that was a joke, did you? Nope. No. It was that bad, Aaron. <laughs> it can't all be zingers. <laughs> and they laugh at a lot of stuff, so that's safe. Right. Yeah. Aaron's I much. Think you, Aaron, I think you hit the mute button, honestly. Aaron's much funnier than this. Um, <laughs> You are Tad Western's cousin. Yeah, and, I am. And the misery in that family has produced two very funny individuals. Misery? <laughs> Your misery family. What makes people funny? Yeah, humor is misery distilled. Sure. <laughs> now, all right, so what do we do about this? I, I look at it and I go, do... At this point, this is a constitutional argument between these various groups. We have a constitutional argument taking place right now with Donald Trump. What if the Russians, the Chinese, the European Union, Venezuela, Colombia, all said, we don't recognize Donald Trump as the legitimately elected president because of Russian interference, and uh, we, we recognize Nancy Pelosi as the president. 
Would that not be destabilizing for the world? Now, for some reason, we think, oh, that'll never happen. But in a lot of ways, that is kind of what is happening here from a political level. And so I ask the three of you, should we get involved in the constitutional argument of another country or should we allow them to work this out? I think the founders admonition says peace, trade and commerce with all nations and entangling alliances with none. Okay. Whipping out some Washington on us. Yeah. The founders admonition <laughs> advice. <laughs> Alina. So how, sh- how do you think we should approach this? I honestly have no idea. Like I, I don't think that, just doing nothing is the right thing to do. But I don't necessarily feel like, oh, we should invade and, and try and take over and, and do all of that. Right. More of a wait and see. Yeah, I think if there it was if it's possible to like help the people, like even if it's just like food and stuff like that, maybe. I, I really don't know. But I yeah. feel like I feel like being like, oh no, this isn't our problem may not be what I feel is right. I know it's unfair to ask you to come up with a, a solution to a world crisis when you've had uh, three hours to think about it. So don't, yeah. yeah, don't worry. But you brought a lot, you brought a lot to the discussion that I thought was very, like, uh, very empathetic, which is what you're good at. You're usually good at trying to make me more of a human. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Harry, what do you think? See, I think we should get in an argument, not the United States, but the human beings, and, just, and let them understand that the biggest problem of all this is government, and that they don't need one, and they should just toss it off, and just not look back, and just keep going forward. Yeah, I said it. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just letting, the, I'm letting it marinate a little bit. You know, Alina, you got to let it marinate. Yes. Yes. You know, uh, all right. So, yep. Who robbed from them? The government. That's right. Uh, we're, it, it's who, just the people upstairs. Who put, who uh, got people on live television and fired people? The government did. Our neighbors upstairs are either humping <laughs> or something's going on, or they're moving, or both. They're annoyed that I'm talking so loud. They said, We just think you listen to the radio on Tuesday nights. But it's very distracting. It's very loud. I don't think you can hear it, but it's loud. Sound like a broomstick on yeah. the floor. It, it, probably telling me to shut up. But he's pretty cool. He drew a dick on my car. So <laughs> That was who did it? Yeah. I, so I, I walked out one morning, and we had like a foot of snow on our cars. And uh, I just was wiping it with a big broom, and I almost wiped it off, and I saw this dick on my car. And I took a photo and you know, said, my car has been vandalized again. <laughs> Everyone laughed. Uh, At least it had wheels. Th- exactly right. T- it's going to be negative 11 tomorrow, so hopefully it starts. But uh, The old cock bandit struck again. <laughs> he barely has wheels with that Fiat that he drives around. Harry, you drive a 1983 Subaru. Shut up. It is a 93 Subaru Estate vehicle. It's a legacy estate. Okay. It looks like something James Neese drives. Uh, he, right now, he's driving a Sebring, just like you. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to do a daily on the shutdown. Let's. Do we want to talk about the shutdown? We're 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 long into the episode. Uh, what do you guys think? Should I, should I? Should we keep going, or should I just do this as a daily? We can we can we can pause and record the daily. Now you're thinking. Yeah. Now you're thinking. All right. That way, Alina doesn't have to stick around and be bored with us. <laughs> She's, she's young, and she's got to get out on the town and do young people things. It's too cold to do young people things. I'm already in my PJs. Oh, okay. You're kind, yeah. of, an old, you're kind of an old lady anyways. I am an old lady. <laughs> yeah. Well, she does have PJs, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's long sleeve. It's too cold. <laughs> All right. So final thoughts for the episode. Aaron, final thoughts. Final thoughts. It was good to come back. Um Glad you had me. I'm glad we didn't have to get the tape down that you bought. I bought years ago this tape. In preparation for my next. That my just next. says shut up. Because yeah. when Aaron would come on, it's just a low murmur of nonsense. Well, I was drinking back then. A lot. Yeah, yeah you were very too hearted. You are very good tonight. Yeah, I was drinking too hearted ale with our, your former 
um, partner. And, uh, you know, I, Nay, I, former lover. Oh, I'm Nay. Just <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's good to come back on and get the uh, creative juices flowing again. And I hope you'll have me soon. Yeah, please mop that up. Absolutely. Uh, Alina, let's give you the final, final thoughts. On, on today? On Venezuela, on anything. You can talk about whatever you want. No, then I'll be here forever. I don't know. I think it's really important for just people to, like, realize what's happening. Like, I'm glad I was able to help in some way. Your mom was very concerned that, uh, that this would tip the balance. Yeah. No, she... She came, she called me when she was at work, first of all. And then she was like, I need you to send me the link to the radio. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I was, she was like, your thing that you're doing. I was like, first of all, it's not on the radio. Second of all, if I send you a link, you're not even going to know how to open it. (laughs) And then she was like, oh no, you have to have your aunt call in. And I was like, okay, well, she lives in California. Like, this is too last minute. This isn't going to work. She was like, Alina, you have to. This is going to reach millions of people and it's going to decide the fate of the country. And I'm like, oh, I, I, I didn't realize that this is what was happening today. <laughs> she said that to me. I was very flattered. I mean, she was like, call Chris right now. And then you didn't answer. And she was like, oh, my gosh. I don't know what she said to you because she left my room. So I, I, I don't know what she said. She, she, well, it was very awkward. She answers. She's like, hello. I'm like, yeah, hello. She, she was like talking all nice to you and she was like screaming at me before. I know. I was worried that I was going to get the, the chocolate clava. Yeah. You and, got it wrong again. I know. And <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, I don't speak Spanish Baxter. Um, and so she goes, how are you? I'm well, I'm well as I am well as well. Indeed. <laughs> she said indeed at one point, it was very cute. And then uh, she, she told me about your aunt, your aunt. And I was like, yeah, she'd be great if you can get her in like the next 30. Because here's the thing. She sound, she has like a big degree and like is Venezuelan and she's a normal person. Like yeah. you, I can have you on here and you, you'll hang with her nonsense. But like somebody like that, I'd want to do a formal interview. I don't want to subject them to like an hour and a half conversation of nonsense. Like you, yeah. I don't mind. She you made can. me feel very good about myself after she talked about my aunt. Right. <laughs> you basically was you're not qualified to do this yeah that's what she was like saying she was like well, you don't know anything to, to give her mom some credit i was listening uh to the young turks um podcast on the way over here yeah. and, and listening to their opinion about venezuela and, and they're very worried about libertarian ideas affecting this situation really yeah i mean <laughs> they basically are uh, blaming us we they are very worried that we're going to swing them into a, a right wing dictatorship and that business is going to take over the yeah. country, you know, based on our uh, you know Cato Institute and different think tanks. These uh, these people are out of their mind. Like the the left, the socialists in this country just cannot come to terms with the fact that socialist governments fail and starve people to death. Like, uh, they would not admit any fault towards socialism at all. It's all because of big business, and um, we, are, we are controlling, somehow libertarians are controlling the oil prices just so that our narrative that socialism sucks will come true. <laughs> I mean, I just just listened to like 20 minutes on the way over here, the first part of the podcast. And so it it was like not the last podcast, but if you go back, maybe two um, labeled something to do with Venezuela and uh, you'll you'll hear all about their their crazy Alex Jones type theories. Literally, it's insanity. Like you would think that like much to Alina's point, I would if you've watched Jericho. And there's a scene where eventually the military rolls into Jericho and you you're filled with such relief for these people. Like, I would love to have that. I would love to be able to say like, yes, we should send in the military and save these people and invade this country for their own good. But the results are what the results are. Like you have to, at some point have to look at the, the consequences to your ideas and go, this thing that I feel would work isn't actually going to produce the results I want. And I don't get how people on the left just don't seem to have that ability. Mm-hmm. Like you just can't see that. And I'm not talking about like your, your liberal who looks at the constitution and says, I think we should emphasize civil rights. Like 
I'm talking about the Young Turk type people who just cannot see, like Ocasio-Cortez just cannot see Venezuela yeah. and realize that the Green New Deal would do much the same thing. It's yeah. bizarre. No, how, no matter how well-intended your ideas are, if the... Um, the consequences the con- to the... Yeah, yeah if, if, if they don't come to fruition, then you need to admit where you're wrong and, right. and look for facts, you know, and they, they look right past the facts. Facts don't care about your feelings. So, uh, Lena, we, we, we don't want to interrupt your... But yes, I thought it was very funny. Your mom it, it politely said that millions of people could hear this, and so it's important we get someone who's qualified to do it. Yeah, and she also had a solution for it all. Like, she said that she's like, I don't understand why it's so difficult, why we can't just send someone to just kill the guy and be done with all of this. She's like, if the U.S. won't do it, we should just call the mafia in Colombia and they'll take care of it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like my first sensible thing to do because I definitely have the mafia on speed dial. Like, she wanted you to call the mafia. Yeah, she made it seem like she was going to do it if I didn't do it. <laughs> your mom, I love your mom. No, you can have her. <laughs> for, every, for every Chavez there's a Maduro though and you get rid yeah. of Maduro there's there's someone else waiting it's a great point you, so you, you create a vacuum and it's you don't know who that vacuum is going to be filled by yeah and you yeah. know we get rid of Saddam Hussein and now you've got ISIS controlling Iraq you exactly know, so your well-intended ideas and uh, always don't produce such great consequences exactly there's right. blowback to deal with yeah there's a there's a political power structure in place and you get rid of one person it doesn't mean that the whole structure collapses you know there's there are very few regimes like uh russia where it's it, you know putin is the central figurehead but if you even if you got rid of putin a medvedev or whatever would would pop up i mean it, it is it, you you look at it Iraq, where you had Saddam Hussein, you get rid of Saddam Hussein, and you still have the ruling factions from the Hussein era getting, you know, fighting with the, the other different factions of Iraq. So, all right. Any final thoughts, Alina? Anything else? No, that's it. Okay. All right. Harry? Correct. Um, I, just to sum up what you guys are saying, the power vacuum is it's a real thing and going people in wanting going in to help with the best intentions. But sometimes you've got to let them do their own thing and sit back. And I'm not saying like it, it does stink when you say, when you think about it, like sit back and I just really sit back and watch, but uh, you just got to be, you can't go in there with guns. You got to be in there with, coming in with human humanitarianism and com- compassion because you've got to let them do their own thing if they're going to get on the back on the world stage and become the powerhouse of south america again they've got to do it on their own and not with any help from anyone from you know from europe or north america they've got to do it on their own well at what and point it, harry does strategic support play a role though so that that is the question that i would i would ask listeners and i'd love to hear thoughts about it too at what point now strategic support gets messy right so when you right, look, yeah. when you look at uh why why are why is isis driving around in brand new toyotas well the strategic support that because went to the rebels ended reliable. up in the hands of isis they're very reliable Co- correct <laughs> we st- we need to not we need to keep toyota at bay let them have nissans in chevy right. trucks so they'll break down okay no, so, no, none of these reliable trucks but, but what about what about lending legitimacy in this particular case, just lending legitimacy and raising the issue of this 35 year old Guido by acknowledging his delegation over Maduro? I get what we, we what allow the level free of market support. You can al- what what you allow is um, the businesses to find out if it's legitimate or not. If they're legitimate, businesses will invest. Allow the market to do that. Allow businesses to do that because if it's stable enough for for Coca-Cola to reopen that plant and the person who's in charge of the government, you know, is going to allow Coca-Cola to do what they do best and make money and bring in jobs and do do everything in that economy, then, you know, that's who you – you let the businesses support those people that are there. I think 
honestly, I think the government is just in the way and it just can, you just, it will ham fist and make this process worse as they get in, involved. They're making it worse. So people can't leave that situation or make preventing other people uh, to go in that, in that, into that situation to help on their own. I think the government should just get out of the damn way. Yeah. Maybe some of the, um, people that are actually creating jobs and opportunities and, and money and capital will come back. You know, they're in Miami right now and they're in Colombia and they've moved, they've moved all their resources out of the, the country because mm-hmm. of the crazy socialist tax rates and things. And uh, maybe they'll start to move back. I mean, they have to have some sort of sense of pride about their country of origin and they most likely want to live there, but, uh, yeah. made it impossible yeah i think uh, i think alina can speak to that i mean you feel very i mean I'm, i imagine it has to be confusing or odd sometimes because i'm fully american i don't i i don't you know world war one and world war two s- scraped all the german all the germany <laughs> out of my uh, lineage so like i don't i don't identify as a german american i don't i don't have pride in germany i don't have any connection to my home country but you you know, you were born in Colombia, you go there, you have family there, and you, you took me to a Colombian uh, event. I can only describe it as an event uh, <laughs> here in Indianapolis. It was a lot of fun. It was so much, it was so great because you just see people who are fully Colombian and fully American at both the did, same time. Did you get to salsa? I did not dance. Uh, Alina was too busy. Huh? It was raining the whole time. Yeah, but that didn't stop people. And let me tell you, people were great dancers. And I fell in love like three times. <laughs> but, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of Venezuelans who want to go back to Venezuela. Yeah, I think there's very few people that if they had to leave their home country, that they just left without being sad at all. I think that people forget that part too. Like if someone's choosing to leave their home country, they're not just being like, Oh, I'm just going to move out of town. Like you're leaving your place of birth. You're leaving where your family's from, where you grew up, what you know, the language you speak, the customs, you know, and you're moving all that. Like, so I don't think that's like a light issue. So I would, I would assume people want to go back. They've just made it impossible right now. Yeah. The incentive to move and the hardship is greater than staying where you're at. Yeah. Correct. You know, it's the same thing we saw in, when uh, Katrina happened. A lot of those people were like, I want to go back to New Orleans. I want to fix it. So let's. Yeah, absolutely. I think immigration, people don't understand that the flow of, of people is the same as the flow of capital. I mean, when, when a place is free and healthy, people flow into it. And when it's unhealthy, people flow out of it. That's why they're going to Columbia. The, the, the conditions in Columbia aren't, are, are safer you're not going to get killed you can eat um you know one of the videos i watched um it was a month's salary for a hot dog like you had to work a whole month to get one hot dog like that's how bad the the economic conditions in venezuela are in honduras and guatemala and el salvador that's why people are coming here because it's a month's salary to afford a, a single meal that's not even all that nutritious like it it, people don't make the journey in these caravans to come to the United States because they just want to commit crimes and rape white women. Like they come here because they, they can't afford to live or survive in their home countries. And they're going to a place where they know I have a better shot of survival if I go to the United States. And even if I deal with immigration. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, Alina, your, your family, your, your naturalized citizen but your family came here for economic opportunity at a time when Columbia was not great. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were very fortunate in the sense that my dad uh, found a job here and his, he's an engineer. His job helped tremendously in that whole process. As in like they paid all the fees, they helped with getting a lawyer. And even then, even I feel like my family's case was the best case scenario and it still took years and it still took a lot of work. And yeah. I feel very fortunate because I don't share that story. Like, that's not a common story. Yeah. I, I, I'm fortunate that Alina was in Colombia during the uh, children separation incident. And at the same, because she would have, she would have flown to Washington and ripped off her chakala. Chancla. Chancla. 
and beaten Donald Trump with it because you would have been, you were like, what's happening? I don't have internet here. I'm like, I'm not even going to tell you. Yeah, no, I would have been livid. Yeah, it was bad. And then naturaliz- naturalized citizens, if they lied on their, they're starting to like even go after that where it's like if, you're, if your dad had lied on his thing or whatever, then they denaturalize. But like it's crazy to me because you're an American. Like you're, you're 20. 10 years this year. How, how long? 10 years this yeah. year. And you've been here almost 15. Almost 20. Yeah, you learned how to speak English how? Uh, when I moved to this country, I only knew Backstreet Boys songs. Uh, and then, yeah, there you go. And then my mom said I just didn't talk for months. So eventually I just picked it up. Tell me why. If you know Alina, her not hey, talking for <laughs> So Alina's baby pictures are the funniest things I've ever seen in my life because she just has a scowl her whole life. From, from the time she was born, she's just pissed she's alive. <laughs> yeah, my mom said I was born pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Harry, final thoughts? He's muted. He's... Oh, uh, sorry, choking, actually. Choking. <laughs> choking, actually, from the Bastard Boy comments still. <laughs> but, um, let's see, I did the... Um, Col- Columbia is a... I will say this, like one of my favorite things, I was like, Colombia is a beautiful country. Um, it's one of the few South American countries I would like to visit. It is freaking gorgeous. Um, if you don't think so, or really want to see the, some of the true stuff of uh, uh, some of like the cool streets of it, uh, the Grand Tour season three, they just went down to Colombia, the other th- um, which was, it's freaking gorgeous. The other thing, um, the hyperinflation, I think, uh, I think, Luke Radowski of We Are Change went down to Venezuela last year and was just showing off the hyperinflation of uh, Venezuela and like actual terms actually going there and taking American dollars and uh, trading it into boulevards. And then some of the, uh, let's see, the the ripples of some of the stuff that was happening when a lot of people say like, hey, you can see it happening was when Venezuela became a hot spot for Americans and Europeans on um, sailing trips to stop in Venezuela to exchange toilet paper and other essentials <laughs> to trade for, uh, um, for basically, they didn't have to spend money. They basically just brought essentials on their boats and sold them in the country and they could do whatever they want with it and use it as money. But I'm done. That's it. That's all okay. All right. I just, I try not to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. First time ever. Work counters. <laughs> All right. So for me, uh, I've said a lot. I won't, I won't cover Venezuela. I will thank Craig DaCosta, the Libertarian Coalition, Jason Doolittle, Ed Brehob, and Christy Avery for being our $100 a month supporters here on the show. Uh, we, if, you, if you love these kind of interesting conversations with fascinating people, it takes a lot of work. Uh, to to put all this stuff together, we've got the research team in Hody. You've got all the equipment that it takes, uh, the, the monthly cost for something like Zoom, so we can talk to people all over the. You know, Alina's two hours away, and we got to hear her thoughts. All that takes money, and all of that comes from the Patreon support. Uh, we really don't get paid for our time. We many of us put in tens of hours a week uh, for a hobby, and we do it because we want to give you fascinating information that you don't hear anywhere else. So, uh, if you like this, if you think that this is worth your time, then please uh, join, become a patron of We Are Libertarians. Uh, WeAreLibertarians.com slash support. You can sign up on PayPal. You can sign up through Bitcoin or uh, the Patreon. You, you can uh, sign up many different ways and support us many different ways. And I want to thank you for that. Uh, we, I switched categories to government and organizations, and I noticed today we are number 40 in that category now. So We Are Libertarians is a top 50 podcast in one of the iTunes categories. If you would like to help us get to number one in that category, it is completely possible. News and politics is tough, and and we do fit the description of a government and organization podcast. So please go rate and review us in iTunes. Subscribe on, you know, I listen on Downcast, but I went into the podcast catcher app or the iTunes on my computer and I subscribe to We Are Libertarians on all those different devices. Do that for us, please, because then that tells iTunes, hey, these guys are hot right now. And so they're going to bump us up the rankings. 
so please support us in that way. If we can maintain a, a, a top spot up in that, in one of these categories, that really helps us grow in a significant way. Um, and, uh, you know, we just passed our 2 millionth download. Uh, we are, we officially passed 2 million downloads this past week, about 10,000 downloads an episode. Uh, the dailies get about 3,000 now. That's up from 1,000 two months ago. If only every download gave you a dollar. That's right. Just one dollar. Just one dollar. Kick in a dollar. You could get like a two-bedroom luxury apartment. You sign up. If you sign up on pay. Yeah, exactly. I could. <laughs> this, you're not supposed to blow the mystique. Uh, <laughs> it, it really does help and make a big difference. And I'm able to do more and uh, subscribe to better services or do more, you know, do more with video or eventually hire a person to, uh, to organize some more stuff. So we really do need your financial support. It is how we fund all of this. It costs a lot to run a podcast network of this size. We have about 40 people involved in this. Those people, if you are involved in We Are Libertarians, I don't like to ask you to pay for equipment, to pay for services. I want to give you the tools, you know, somebody like Brian Nichols and the Brian Nichols show or the daily hosts or boss hog of Liberty, you know, they have their own Patreon. So we're going to have a talk and they're going to have to start uh, pitching in some more. And I have to start charging them a fee. Every time Jeremiah self promotes, he's going to have to send me $5. <laughs> I'll be the richest man ever, Harry. Uh, so, so yeah, Harry's drinking. He spit out his uh, $5,000 scotch. So, you know, but it does, you know, when you bring on somebody, we're onboarding a couple new podcasts pretty soon and I want to be able to send them equipment. And uh, if they're going to get involved in We Are Libertarians, I don't want them to have to pay f to do it. So uh, if they're going to give their time and talents and resources. So please pitch in that way. Thank you to everybody who downloads. Even if uh, you're just a stranger out there and you never pitch in, I uh, thank you for listening because those numbers really do help. And it's, pretty humbling and cool to get to say that we have this many people listening to us. It's not quite millions yet, like uh, Alina's mom thinks, but we're getting there. And uh, these are some of the ways that you can make it possible. So uh, Harry's showing off his box on camera. Uh, <laughs> doers, some sort of gross liquor. Uh, honestly, Harry, you, you need to be like Aaron and stop drinking. Mm-hmm. Clean Life 3.7. <laughs> right. <laughs> I can't remember which one I'm on now. Uh, we need to talk to, we, we need to talk about the keto soon because I'm going to, I'm going to do the keto. I, I had a porterhouse steak tonight. Hannah did a great job with it. I, see, I don't have a Hannah. That's the problem. She need... seared it on one side in cast iron and then she broiled it on the other. Al Alina, Perfect come cook for me, please. Pink center. Perfect. I don't think you can have empanadas on keto. So what are you going to do? I don't know, man. That'd be tough to give up. She taught me how to make empanadas and she taught me how to make pico de gallo. And I love... Pico's good. Oh, you can do yeah, pico. You can have that. You can have I all love... that. Except Not the empanada. A... Unless you make the shell out of cheese. Mm -hmm. I need like the next week to just go crazy. Just like empanadas and Cracker Barrel and all the stuff that I'll <laughs> never be able to eat again. All right. That's enough of this. Thank you to Hody Johns for doing the research. Thank you to uh, Aaron, to Alina for spending the time. It was fun having you. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And Harry, it's been a pleasure having you on, and thank you for uh, Skyping in. Uh, Zoom in? What? what I mean, Zoom in instead of using the Discord. Just All right, right guys. Uh, the, I, before... I just can't take anymore. Do the listeners know the guy from Norway is still in your closet? <laughs> yes, he's frozen in my closet. <laughs> that was fun. I liked that. He was a, he was a great... No, he was. He, he was awesome. a good time, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, always finding interesting people to come on the show like Alina. A lot of fun foreigners lately. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll see you guys tomorrow. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Alina. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>